please welcome LGBTQ advocate Jazz Jennings, GLAD president and CEO Sarah Kate Ellis, YouTube personality Ingrid Nilsson, and journalist and advocate Teek Milan with Mashable's Katie Dupere. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, we're going to just chat a little bit about LGBTQ representation in the media today. My name is Katie Dupere. I'm a social good reporter for Mashable. Um, and yeah, all of these folks have been introduced. But just to run through our lineup, we have Sarah Kate, Jazz Jennings, Teek Milan, and Ingrid Nielsen. Um, so yeah, talking a little bit about media representation. It's a super big topic. We've got 20 minutes, so hopefully we can solve like any issues that we have <laughs> with representation when it comes to the community. It'll be great. So I think kind of to look at where we are now, it's really important to look at where we've been. Um, so Sarah Kate, obviously GLAD has roots um, kind of spurred from the defamatory coverage of the community to come out of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. So um, I was wondering if you could kind of take us back at the evolution of media coverage when it comes to the community. Sure. Um, well, we know that media coverage um, can be the most effective and efficient way to change hearts and minds. So when GLAAD was formed 30 years ago, it really was to change the conversation and the narrative around the AIDS crisis. It was very much targeting gay men. And as GLAAD evolved, what we did was we had first looked at media and journalism, and then we started very quickly looking at Hollywood and portrayals, or the lack thereof of LGBTQ people in the media. And so it was really about lobbying, you know, Hollywood and news media journalists to have them portray LGBTQ people in a, in a fair and accurate way. And fair and accurate is really important because our stories, if you didn't know someone who was gay or back in the 80s, you just thought that they hid in this closet and they were demons. And so it was really important to start to show what a gay person look like. And when we do that, we humanize people. When we tell people stories, we get to know people, and then you can't hate someone whose story you know. And it's been a very effective model for us. And I think that looking into the future, though, over the past 30 years, we've made great, great strides. Um, but when we look into the future, we still have a long way to go. And I think that there's a misperception because content, streaming content is doing a very good job at looking at, especially the Q and LGBT, the T and the Q and LGBTQ. Um, and, but you know, in network television, we're still not seeing a lot of diversity of character. And in studios, we're, it, you know, it might might as well be 1980s still. Um, the lar the six largest studios really aren't representing the LGBTQ and community, and that has actually bigger ramifications because that's one of America's biggest cultural exports is movies. And so, not only aren't we in small towns in America, but internationally, that is an opportunity for us to share our stories and our lives, and it's a very big missed opportunity at this, at this state, stage in the game. Definitely, definitely. So, I mean, kind of to your point of what you were just saying, um, the way that people come to understand our lives as part of the community um, is through media. Mm -hmm. And the way we also come to understand ourselves is, is via media. Um, so I'm wondering, um, kind of directed to all of you, because I think that we all have personal stories with this, how have you seen media shape how people kind of come to understand you and your life and your identity, and also how you see yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at me? I'm sure. <laughs> you can start if you want. I mean, when I, I'm, I'm 44 now, mm -hmm. when I was younger, um, there wasn't anyone for me to see who was gay or lesbian. And so I never really thought, I, I never saw a future for myself because I never saw myself um, represented. So I always thought that, you know, come my early 20s, it was just like, poof, my life would be over because I didn't see or imagine what it could be. Um, I think it's different now, and that kids can tune in and see themselves. 
And a lot of times in America, too, in small towns, you know, we live in bubbles somewhat in LA and New York and some of the larger urban areas in America, but a lot of kids still are afraid to come out. A lot of kids are still don't see themselves in their own community. So the television and, and streaming content and social media and digital are really still very important in terms of representing the LGBTQ community. For sure. And I mean, Jazz, you're kind of one yeah. of the younger voices mm -hmm. on this panel. Well, I mean, I practically grew up in the media. I first appeared on television when I was six years old. So it's definitely shaped who I am as an individual. And I honestly don't know who I would be or what I would be like if I hadn't embarked upon that course of life. So, you know, I'm definitely, I, I definitely am grateful to the media for shaping who I am as an individual. Awesome, awesome. You know, for me, um, you know, there still isn't a lot of like trans masculine representation in media, particularly like trans men of color. So, you know, for me, I had to imagine myself into existence, right? And when we're thinking about media, like it's not just, you know, corporate media and this is like larger representation, but, you know, I found representation in social media. You know, there was a, there was a Yahoo group that I found and it was all black trans men, like 400 black trans men. I thought I was the only one on the planet until I found this social, until I found this social media group. So this helped me understand, you know, that I existed in the world and I wasn't the only one. So I think, you know, as we move this conversation forward, you know, we, it's not enough just to have transgender people in front of the camera, but we also have to be behind the camera. We also have to have some type of uh, control over our narratives and also have a more intersectional approach. You know, I think oftentimes we have this, this narrative set up that LGBT people and black people are, are mutually exclusive. And, you know, obviously we're not because I exist. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, um, and that's the thing about media. You know, media is it's not just that we document the culture is not just us telling stories, but we are we are creating culture as we do it. So that's why it's so important that we have this representation that says that we exist, that you know that we exist here, like you said, to humanize us, right, and to and to start to combat some of the like the systemic issues that we're having. But at the same time, what we have to understand is that even though we are having this uptick in in uh, invisibility, you know, we have Laverne who is everywhere and trans folks like you, like myself, who are all you know who are who are very visible. You know, the violence against trans women has increased since this. So, you know, the, so this representation has to translate into like substantial, like cultural change. Like, so it's not enough for us to be represented, but our representation has to start to shift the culture to something that's more inclusive. So that's what I would like to see, like through these conversations about uh, global representation and through these art conversations about what it means to be accepted and recognized in our culture. Okay, bye -bye. So I mean, and Ingrid, you obviously uh, came out on YouTube and uh, have since used the platform to kind of advocate for yourself and uh, your identity and for women and, and things like that, just by kind of depicting your everyday life and just kind of simple things. So I'm wondering why you see that self-representation kind of to Teek's point, kind of creating the content yourself, doing that, um, why you see that self-representation as so essential. Well, <clears throat> I see it as something that is essential because um, I think now more than ever, we are in a time where we're seeing stereotypes just being obliterated and they're visibly being obliterated. And I think that is the key there because, you know, people like myself, people like us here up on stage have always existed. And the difference is people just weren't able to see that. Um, and I, I am someone that, you know, my job is on the internet and every single day my identity is challenged and people tell me that I'm lying and that I'm not who I say I am. And um, I think that for me it's really important to be my authentic self and to share that with people as a feminine presenting biracial gay woman as like, hey, this is what a gay person can look like. You know, we're out here and there isn't one set look. It's not about the way that you look, it's who you are. And I am very appreciative and aware of the foundation that has been laid for me to make this possible, for me to have a safer space, to come out and authentically be who I am. And one quote that I love is, you know, planting the seeds in a garden that 
you may never see. Mm -hmm. And that's what I strive to do every single day because I am currently living in a garden that, whose seeds were planted by generations before me. And I want to build on top of that. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, kind of to go back to you, Jazz, you have been in the public eye since you were six years old, mm -hmm. and now you're almost 16 years old. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been in the public eye for like half of your life, more than half of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm wondering kind of how you've seen coverage, media coverage of your own identity shift in that time. Um, what has that looked like for you? Well, you know, I matured through the me I matured through the media, so I started off as this six-year-old girl who was just declaring her gender identity. And I think that now my message has evolved and developed to the extent where I could share it and help other people live their lives authentically and be true to who they are. So I'm I'm proud of what I've been able to accomplish and it's amazing to see the growth of the community and people really starting to come out of the shadows. Definitely, definitely. And so, um, Teek, mm -hmm. you kind of come from, to the panel with the perspective of being in print media. Mm -hmm. um, and like you were saying before, as a black trans man in that space, that representation as a like sort of content creator often isn't seen, and that representation is often overlooked. Why do you think, I guess, simply being there, being in that space is so essential to the community. You know, I think, um, you know, it's about being a, a model of possibility. You know, I get to write for a bunch of people and I get to travel the country, go to different schools to tell my story. And every time I have young trans men come to me and tell me that they are because I am. You know, and that just means the world to me, you know, that I can talk to these guys. A lot of, a lot of, young, you know, a lot of young men who are low and no disclosure, who are afraid to come out, um, a lot of masculine, gender nonconforming people, you know, they take a look at my life and, and they see the successes that I've had in being able to be on the other side of telling our story, of, you know, of, of telling our story instead of having people tell it for us, you know, um, makes them believe that they can achieve, you know, their dreams as well. So it's really important for us to all have models of possibility, you know. And again, this goes back to, you know, we see when we don't see each other in the media then it makes monsters out of us you know what i'm saying so we have to continue to really you know work hard to make sure that all of us are are having a place that we can uh we can tell our stories and start to shift towards something that looks really equitable for all of us you know what i'm saying and i also think it's important um because as i do this work it's not enough just to just to tell the story, but to tell it in a way that's gonna challenge people to think. You know, not just think about my existence, but to think about their own existence. You know, it's not, you know, I, I am a black man, but it's not my responsibility to teach everybody about race. You have to start to do this thing on your own. I'm transgender, but it's not my job to teach everybody about transness. You have to start to interrogate these things in yourself and understand that my existence may complicate yours, but it doesn't invalidate yours, you know? So I think that this is something we have to, you know, move towards, so, yeah. Great, great. So, I mean, Teek, obviously, I've heard you talk a lot about diversity, and I'm wondering, um, kind of when I was thinking about this panel and, and about us coming together as members of the community to have this conversation, um, I was thinking about how media representation, even today, is still kind of stuck in this um, white gay male norm that we're used to seeing um, in, in mainstream media. That's shifting, I think, in, in other smaller forms of media. But uh, kind of for, for the rest of you, Sarah, Kate, Jazz, and Ingrid, I'm wondering um, uh, it, the, the importance of diversity that you see in, in our media. Why do you think um, diverse representation is so important to telling our stories? And, and sort of uh, why is it so essential? I could, I could start off by just saying that um, as the landscape of America changes, so should it be reflected in the content that's being created. And so I think that's just top shelf ideas. But furthermore, you know, as we look, you know, not even to 2030, but to 2020, we're looking at a vastly different country than we're looking at today as the Gen Z generation really starts to take form. And you know there are numbers quoted out there that there'll be 40% of the consumer population, right? And so about 35% of them identify as LGBTQ of that 40%. So when you start to look at those numbers, you can see that we're headed towards a tectonic shift in the way that we see identity in this country. And in order to 
grab those consumers, to engage with those consumers, to, you need to be reflecting their lives. So I think the old narrative isn't going to, it doesn't have that much longer where it's going to run its, its course. And, and I'm really excited about that because I think that we're going to start to see more diverse stories and we need those diverse stories. Seeing it through one lens or being told through one lens is just so narrow. Is it, considering all the, I mean, just even this little panel is just so diverse in different stories and different paths and it's so enlightening and it touches people out there. So I think just by a course of where we're headed with this Gen Z generation and the millennials, one third of millennials identify as LGBTQ. So we, we're seeing a, a shift in the population and media needs to reflect that. It should be a leader, um, but it hasn't been because Hollywood tends to follow an older formula that they're used to to following because it's safe. And um, I think that you're not gonna engage this consumer unless you, you move outside of your safety zone. For sure, for sure. You know, I think that, I think, you know, like what is diversity, honestly? We were, having this, we were having this conversation earlier. Like people throw this word diversity around all the time. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this kind of like antiquated diversity model where it's like, I want one of you, one of you, and this exotic one over here. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Like we have to start rethinking this and have like a model of inclusion. Right. You know what I'm saying? An inclusion that goes from the top down, that goes from behind the camera to the front of the camera. So that's what I would like to see start happening when we talk, start to talk about diversity. Like, like shifting what diversity actually is so that it turns into something that's really meaningful you know what I'm saying that's happening in Hollywood as well as in other like media yeah I kind of wish that the word di diversity was just non-existent and we used reality instead mm -hmm. and I just I would love to see reality reflected in the stories that are told because it's a world that we live in mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Good. Definitely. So with the few minutes that we have left, obviously at this, this summit, we're looking forward to especially 2030. 2030 now is in illuminated letters behind us. Um, and so um, kind of looking forward to that future, um, it's really important to obviously think about all the things that we're, um, we're talking about right now. But I'm wondering, what do we really need to do to make sure that we get to a future where there's reality depicted, where inclusion is, is kind of just the norm. Um, what kind of steps do we need to take? Hmm. You know, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like all of us up here are, are doing that work you know, to, to have a shift in the culture. But I think it's just for everybody as individuals to start to make space, you know, within their hearts, within their minds, starting to interrogate, you know, their, their own internalized issues and, and starting to understand, like, how we can start to leverage our privileges um, to create something, to create, like, a, a space of solidarity with each other. You know, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that we can be doing, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, that's up to all of us. Like, I can't tell everybody else what they need to be doing, you know? And I'm tired, you know? <laughs> you know, every Everybody has to start figuring that out for themselves, you know, but we have to, it starts inside. You work from the, we have to work from the inside out. Yeah, and I think that along with all of this work that we're doing, we should remember to be patient with ourselves, with other people, but not passive. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Be patient, but not passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. I also think that, you know, as we look to the future, it's, it's, all of us demanding the change, you know, and and supporting what what we see as the change, and and not supporting what we don't see as the change, and and you're starting to actually see it, right? At Glad, we've been working really hard, pushing Hollywood on on studio movies and, and being more inclusive. But this past year, you started to see these campaigns pop up, right? Like give Elsa a girlfriend or give Captain America or one of those superheroes a boyfriend. And so you're starting to hear from the people. And if we work that on both angles, somebody's going to have to move eventually, right? And we're going to start to see more inclusion in those kinds of big films. So I think it's everybody's, as Teek was saying, it's everybody's responsibility to own a piece of it to question themselves, their intention, what they're doing with their power in this world and their influence and access, so. Amazing, definitely. Well, I mean, thank you guys so much for joining me up here to talk about this really important issue. Uh, it was a lot of fun, so thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.